Avengers Endgame is a massive juggernaut of a film. It's not just a movie, it is a cultural event. For that reason, it seemed like the perfect time to release my most epic ranking yet. It's so big, it's requiring three different parts. Today, I'm gonna start ranking all 58 theatrical Marvel movies from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies way too much. Today I am starting a three-part series where I am going to rank every theatrical Marvel movie from all of the different continuities and shared universes or solo films. Today we are talking about the 18 worst Marvel movies. In a couple of days we will be talking about the middle 20 movies and then on Saturday I'll be giving my picks for the 20 best Marvel movies or if you're watching in the future you can check them out right up here. As for which movies are included. It is theatrical films, not made for TV movies and not to direct to video movies. One final thing before we get started, people frequently ask me where I get my posters, my Funkos, and what gear I use. There is a link down below where you can get an answer to all of those questions. With that said, let's get started. In last place is Howard the Duck. From my perspective, the first Marvel movie is still the absolute worst. This is a bizarre and shockingly bad misfire from George Lucas of all people. It has no idea what it wants to be. Is it a satire? Is it a comedy? Is it a romance between a woman and a duck? Is it a big space adventure? Like the first hour of this movie is about Howard, a duck from outer space, landing on Earth, befriending a girl in a band, and becoming her band manager. The second hour of the movie is about an evil space lord trying to conquer the Earth. A bit of a shift there. I also have no clue what age range they're going for, because there's no shortage of very juvenile humor. Also, there's multiple shots of duck boobs in the first 10 minutes of the movie and a double entendre fake sex scene between a woman and a duck. Now, I can understand how this would be a cult classic for people who love bizarre and weird films, but for normal people, this is the type of film you get all of your funniest and most obnoxious friends together to watch it as a group where you can quack jokes. Coming in at number 57 is the Fantastic Four 1994 in one of the most cynical moves in all of Hollywood history, this movie was made exclusively so that the studio could keep the rights to the Fantastic Four. This is documented in the film Doomed. The movie was never intended to be released in the worst part. They didn't even tell the director or the cast. In fact, Wizard Magazine even ran articles about this film. As a child, I read articles in that magazine, saw pictures from the sets of this film and waited for it to come out. And it never did. The film is amateurish on almost every single level, except the score. I actually kind of dug the score to the film, but the costumes by today's standards look like bad cosplay. There's also effects in this film that are essentially the equivalent of a glove on a broomstick being reached towards the screen. And even the plot gets weird. There's a strange subplot about sewer people and a wedding in the end. This is a fantastic con job that's really tough to sit through. Next is Fantastic Four from 2015. I was late to the party on this one. I saw it a year after it came out. So I'd heard from audiences, from critics, and from the director himself how bad this movie was. So when I first started watching it, I actually thought, this this is pretty good. And then you get to the midpoint of the film when they get their powers and this whole thing just crumbles. The movie basically skips over the second act of the movie. It's about 10 minutes long of jumbled storytelling and time jumps and we go straight to the third act that's totally generic, including even a sky beam and garbage flying over a city. Supposedly Fox slashed the budget at the last minute and Josh Trank had to cut out multiple action sequences with just weeks before shooting. Then on set, he supposedly was having meltdowns. Who knows what the second half of this movie was supposed to be, well, <laughs> besides Josh Trank. But what we got was a disaster of reshoots, bad wigs, and incoherent storytelling. At number 55 is Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. After the first Ghost Rider wasn't particularly well received, they decided to do a kind of reboot, 
kind of sequel, so it's like a requel. It's a reset, but we still got Nicolas Cage, and there's a decent setup for a movie inside of the film. The script comes from David Goyer of Blade and Dark Knight fame, but then they got the directors of Cranked, to create it. And those two creative forces don't feel like a particularly good fit. It feels like you can tell where David Goyer is trying to write this movie with biblical types and symbolisms, and then the guys from Crank are like, and let's have Ghost Rider start peeing. The movie starts and closes energetic enough, but the middle section slows to a halt when they go and visit some monks. I feel like this movie could have been quite a bit better in the hands of a different director, probably a more horror-based director, but as is, this movie feels like eating ice cream covered in ketchup. And number 54 is Blade Trinity. Of all the movies on this list, this might be the one that I've watched the most and gotten a little bit of a kick out of, but it's not a good movie. The action is handled pretty well. Ryan Reynolds is kind of doing his prototype of Deadpool, and it seems like Reynolds and Beale are having a lot of fun on set. But when it when it comes to the story, the movie has no shortage of plot lines and absolutely no clear plot. Each scene seems to set up a new subplot inside the film, delivers exposition, and then it goes absolutely nowhere. And then the next scene gives us more plot lines, more exposition, and they don't tie together at all, and they're not moving forward towards anything in particular. Apparently, Wesley Snipes was an absolute disaster on set to work with. We were in Vancouver and Wesley Snipes was going crazy. He would only answer to the name Blade. You, you couldn't call him. <laughs> he would only answer to Blade? The Blade, yeah. He would communicate with, with uh, post-its that he would give to the director and each one he would sign Blade. So, <laughs> so while I do have some fun with this one, it is not good. Coming in at number 53 is X-Men Origins Wolverine. This is a professionally made disaster. Much like Wolverine in the bathroom sequence, everything that this movie touches, it destroys. The X-Men continuity, destroyed. Sabretooth, destroyed. Wolverine's origin, destroyed. The Merc with a mouth, Deadpool, destroyed. And then as this is a prequel, it has all the common prequel problems. You have them showing us characters before they're the heroes that we enjoy, so we're seeing them do things that we don't really want to see them do. The tone and humor all feel off. The big plot twist in the third act doesn't make a lot of sense. And for as expensive as this entire movie looks, the effects could look shockingly bad, especially Wolverine's claws. There's movies on this list because of budget constraints or because because of drama behind the scenes. This movie doesn't have any of that. It had the budget, it has no excuses, just the creators and the producers had some really bad ideas. Then we've got X-Men The Last Stand. This is a flavorless X-Men film that doesn't do justice to any of its many plot lines. There's a last minute director swap, Brett Ratner stepped in at the last minute and it shows as there's nothing distinct about the direction of this film. The movie also has one too many main plot lines. You've got a storyline about the mutant cure, which goes pretty well with the plot line about Magneto's evil brotherhood, but then it tacks on the Phoenix Saga. So they take one of the most iconic X-Men storylines and create it into just like an extra subplot in the film. The movie also basically shrugs off the death of Cyclops to an unforgivable level. Beyond that, the movie's incredibly light on action until the last 45 minutes of the film. Put all of this together and you just get this very underwhelming X-Men film. And number 51 is Elektra. This is another totally dull, forgettable film. There's nothing about this film that's embarrassing enough to make it interesting or good enough to entertain you. It's just kind of there. The movie chooses to follow a very standard assassin with a heart plotline but then mix it with supernatural elements and the mix just doesn't work right so the whole thing just kind of feels off. If you want a weird movie about people with powers, it's not enough of that, and it's also too weird if you just want an assassin movie. The movie 
movie also feels overly directed, like the director really wanted to impress you with his style. So like in the final fight of the film, there's like sheets flying in front of the screen the whole time. So you can't see the fight, but you can see the director trying to show off. In the end, this is one of the films on this list that's talked about the least because there's nothing to talk about with this film. Kicking off our top 50 is Hulk 2003. This movie is a rage-inducing misfire. On paper, it should be really good. The director was coming off the Oscar-nominated Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, and he followed it up with Brokeback Mountain, which won Best Picture. But there's a big difference between hiring a great director and a great cast and knowing how to bring it to the big screen this movie is jam-packed with terrible ideas, from Hulk dogs to the main villain being a big cloud in the third act. There is just silliness all over this film. But the biggest problem here is the person you would think would be its greatest asset, the director, Ang Lee. Throughout the whole movie, he was building this whole storyline and theme about anger, and because of it, he has all of the actors overcooking it the entire film. Likewise, he chose this visual and editing style that's supposed to match that of comic books. This worked really well last year with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, but here it just feels awkward and distracting. While Abomination doesn't appear inside of this film, the film itself is pretty close to being an abomination. Coming in at number 49 is Captain America 1990. Growing up, I actually had a VHS recording of this movie off of HBO and I watched it all of the time. So I have a good bit of nostalgia for this film and I can be a bit of a defender for it. It does a pretty good job of telling the basic storyline of Captain America and capturing the characters pretty well. But it's also a fairly low budget superhero film from almost 30 years ago, so there's not nearly as much action as there should be, and the action that is present is hilariously over-edited. <laughs> talk about this movie, it's usually as the punchline of a joke, and given its budget and how old it is, it's an easy target. But once you get past the low-hanging fruit, I actually kind of find this movie pretty watchable. Number 48 is Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. Tim Story's Fantastic Four movies are harmless enough. They're meant to just be light-hearted fun, but even based off that low standard, this movie is lacking. The problem is that the movie is only 92 minutes long with the credits, and it has way too many plot lines. It's about space anomalies, the wedding, the team's different responses to their new found fame, the rise of the Silver Surfer, the team breaking up, Galactus wanting to eat the Earth, the return of Doctor Doom, the military teaming up with Doctor Doom. There's enough plot lines for a trilogy of Fantastic Four movies. Add to that, they took a comic book character that looks like this and turned it into this. Now, I totally understand that a gigantic man in space isn't the easiest character to translate to live action so you don't do the character. In the end, we get another fantastic disappointment from the Fantastic Four. Next up is The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Now, it is well documented that the director and the studio had competing visions for this film. The director wanted to make a movie about relationships, and the studio wanted to do a Sinister Six setup movie. When it's Mark Webb's movie about relationships, I actually think it's pretty good, but the actual story is an overcrowded, tonally inconsistent mess. There's multiple plot lines that are either difficult to follow or go absolutely nowhere. The editor tried to piece together Mark Webb's film about relationships in this movie with way too many villains, and in the end, you get this Frankenstein that doesn't do justice to any of it. But what kills the movie is that the villains here are really bad. Rhino is a bad idea executed even worse. Electro borrows the cheese and plot line from Batman Forever, and Green Goblin is far too literal and underdeveloped. While there are a few moments here and there that are spectacular, the film as a whole is definitely not amazing. At number 46 is The Punisher 1989. This movie is 50% generic 80s action movie and 50% Punisher comic book movie, but as these are basically the same thing, there's a lot of overlap. Yet somehow it doesn't manage to do justice to either half of the movie particularly well. There's some strange deviations away 
from the source material that don't make a lot of sense and certainly don't improve the story. And then as an action movie, there's a lot of poorly edited sequences where there's a lot of close-ups to hide the bad stunt work. As much as I love Lundgren, he's still very clearly young as an actor inside of this film. And there's this weird deal going on where they're just like rubbing dirt on his face to give him stubble. It works well enough if you're into both 80s action movies and The Punisher, but for everyone else, you can pretty much skip this movie. Then again, you do get to see Dolph Lundgren's naked butt in the sewer. Number 45, X-Men Apocalypse. On paper, it seems like a great idea to follow up Days of Future Past with a storyline about Apocalypse. The execution? Not so much. For some reason, they decided to do a two-year turnaround on this film, which doesn't give them a whole lot of time to develop the story and write the script. Well, when you do that, you end up with a bunch of competing ideas of varying quality. Thought the plotline about Magneto and his family was fantastic. And then he joins Apocalypse and just becomes this guy floating in the sky trying to kill everyone on Earth. And then Apocalypse himself is such a flat, boring, and lazily written version of the character. They literally wrote him with the mutant power to touch a TV screen and say, learning. And that's how he learns things. While it does have some really high highs, for the most part, it's a bunch of low lows for the X-Men franchise. Coming in at number 44 is Daredevil. Now, I think this is a film that's been overly hated and made fun of over the years, but it's still a deeply flawed film. There's two different cuts of the film. The theatrical cut of the film moves a lot quicker, but it does so by removing about 30 minutes of story out of the film, so what's left doesn't make a lot of sense and is very shallow. But the director's cut has the problem of dragging everything out way too long, so the story doesn't really start until 35 minutes into the film. Also, like many of the early Zero Marvel films, they hadn't quite figured out the tone yet. When it tries to be fun and lighthearted, it gets goofy and campy, and when it tries to be serious, it feels more like melodrama. Now, I will say this, I think the fights in the movie are pretty good, and as I mentioned earlier, I think people pick on this movie way too much. Of course the playground scene is ridiculous. Of course Bullseye is over the top. I just don't think it deserves as much hate as it gets. Real quick before I give you my final three picks for this list, tell me your picks for the worst Marvel movies down below in the comments section. My picks aren't the right ones, they're just mine and I would love to see and talk about yours. Also, I'm gonna be completing this list throughout the rest of the week. The next video drops on Thursday and then the final part drops on Saturday. At number 43 is Ghost Rider. On a story level, I think this is a solid, well-structured Ghost Rider storyline. Add to the mix, Sam Elliott basically playing himself. He's a pretty great addition to the film. But from there, the execution just gets weird. Nicolas Cage seems like a very strange pick to play Johnny Blaze, and the special effects here do not work. The images of a flaming skull popping up out of a leather jacket do not work. This movie's from the same director as Daredevil and it shares those same tonal issues. It's about a character who has powers from hell and it comes off hokey instead of horrifying. Rewatching it, it wasn't as bad as I remembered, but it's still not good. Number 42 is Thor The Dark World. This is easily the most thoroughly boring and forgettable film in the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. Originally, Patty Jenkins was supposed to direct this film, but she got dropped over creative differences. Now, I don't know what she wanted to do with this movie, but it certainly would have been better than what they gave us. They couldn't decide if they wanted to make a movie that's an epic in space, a melodrama, a buddy comedy, a romance. The villain is shockingly forgettable and underdeveloped. He does not have a single defining or distinct characteristic about his personality. And it's tough to know if the plotline is just confusing or incoherent because it's so unbelievably unclear, largely because we don't know what Malkith's motivation is throughout the film. It's got a bunch of superhero stuff. It's in focus. You can see they spent a bunch of money on it, but there's nothing here that's bad enough to keep your interest or good enough to hold your attention. But finally at number 41 is Venom, a bizarre 
tonally uneven film that is jam-packed with plot holes, but yet still strangely endearing, largely because the movie accidentally turns into a rom-com between Eddie and Venom. The movie's story and tone are as messy as Eddie's psychological state. For that matter, Eddie's setup in the film is clunky at best, and there's serious lapses in the timeline and plot logic, and a bunch of the humor just falls flat. It also doesn't help that earlier in the year a movie came out called Upgrade that had a similar voice in the head plotline, and it even stars a guy that looks like Tom Hardy, and it handled it all a lot better. With all of that said, once Venom enters into the storyline, the film is very attractive to me, largely because it's a ton of fun to watch Venom eating people's heads, and the dynamic between Eddie and Venom works really well and can be very funny. I can't say that this is a good movie, but I wasn't bored, it made me laugh, and I had some fun. Be sure to come back later on this week to see the rest of this series, or if you're watching in the future, you can check them out right over there in that playlist. Thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies too much.